Hello, w welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Round Series. And my name is Joe Saramelli, and I oversee Grand Rounds for our department. Uh, this past year in the webinar format, we've had Grand Rounds presentations uh, covering four different areas. Uh, and, and I wanna uh, make a mention about today's presentation because this uh, request for uh, inviting today's presenter, Dr. McCullough came to me in this way and I wanna share that with the department. A, a group of clinicians in, in one of our uh, outpatient settings um, had observed a clinical problem of uh, persistent depressive disorder in, in patients and uh, identified a need for developing clinical skills uh, in, in a treatment model that's effective uh, for individuals with this disorder. And that group so synthesized their thoughts and approached me and asked uh, to invite uh, today's uh, presenter, Dr. McCullough, for Grand Rounds, which, which we did, and, and that's uh, happening today. And that group of clinicians is meeting uh, with Dr. McCullough afterwards. And I want to encourage others who might have a, a similar interest in advancing clinical skills or a research program uh, to approach me. And uh, we can see if uh, inviting someone for Grand Rounds could be helpful for your group and for our department. Uh, and now on to a, a brief presentation uh, for today's presenter, uh, Dr. James McCullough, uh, who retired from Virginia Commonwealth University after 47 years in the Department of Psychology and is now Emeritus Professor of Psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, for most of that time, uh, Dr. McCullough did research on uh, individuals with chronic depression, um, including uh, overseeing a study that occurred at many sites, one of, the, of which one of the sites was here uh, at UW in, in an outpatient clinic. Uh, and Dr. McCullough has also worked as a clinical psychologist and has treated over 450 individuals with chronic depression. Uh, I, I read a recent review article by Dr. McCullough published in Frontiers in Psychiatry in January, 2021. And I'd like to just read two sentences from that uh, as biography uh, for Dr. McCullough as part of the introduction today. Uh, for almost half a century, I have studied the taxonomy of chronic depression and treated the chronically depressed patient even before we had a diagnostic category to describe this disorder. And as a university faculty member, I studied and focused on the treatment of chronic depression for almost 50 years and participating in four national clinical trials conducted at 12 university sites, I, meaning Dr. McCullough, served as principal investigator for my site as we randomized 2,200 chronically depressed outpatients in medication and psychotherapy <clears throat> investigations. And in one trial, we reported the highest response <laughs> rates ever recorded for the persistent depressive disorder patient at 77%, in a group that was treated with a combination of a psychotherapy developed by Dr. McCullough called the Cognitive Behavioral Analysis System of Psychotherapy and Medication. And the results of that trial were published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in 2000. So I'll stop for now and turn it over to, to Dr. McCullough. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'll start out today. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you all, and I'm particularly delighted because if I can give the chronically depressed patient a hand, I'm, that'll really be icing on the cake. There are about 17 million of them in the United States today. But I find this task a little daunting. Uh, daunting because I can't see any of your faces and I'm talking to my screen. And secondly, because giving you an overview of this model, which is not a simple model to administer to one of the most difficult patients, outpatients in clinical practice, uh, the chronically depressed patient, or persistent depressed disorder patient. <clears throat> kind of like giving you a lecture on a radical prostatectomy surgical procedure in 45 minutes and then taking questions. And I, I feel similarly challenged in trying to say 
words that would make this model come alive for you. But we'll have a go and we'll see how far we get. As Joe has said, uh, I was at VCU for 47 years. And most of that time, I had the luxury of focusing on the chronic disorder long before we had a category. And I, I gotta say, it took us 30 years under the leadership of Marty Keller uh, to finally get a, the nomenclature category in DSM-5 in 2013. And some brilliant articles spun off. Uh, Professor Dan Klein at Stony Brook University probably has done more than any other researcher in the world in differentiating between acute major depression, which has dominated the nomenclature in the DSMs until 2013 and chronic depression. Uh, so with that said, I'll talk a, just briefly about my career. Uh, it was really divided into two parts. One half of it was involved with investigating and doing research with the diagnostic classification of the chronic disorders. Uh, I spent a lot of time DSM-4, DSM-4R, and DSM-5 in, in addressing the chronic depression and the need for an independent nomenclature. The second thing that I have done at VCU is to construct a treatment for this disorder. And I think after today, you will see a little bit more clearly why I did this. Uh, I'll give you a cursory overview. And while we are on this screen, I want you to look at the last two items of these books that I have written. You can pick up both of these books uh, and Mike Walker will send out these links to everyone on the call, the McCullough's Rom and Pemberthy, you can get at amazon.com for about $11, $12. Gives you a brief overview of the therapy model. And the last book is a memoir that I've write, uh, written, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But either one of these books will give you an exposure uh, to what CBAS is all about. And I, those of you that are interested, I highly recommend these two books. We really need to differentiate between episodic or acute major depression and persistent depressive disorder. As you all know, episodic major depression <clears throat> is a condition that lasts, has to last for at least two weeks to meet criteria for a diagnosis. More often than not, episodic major depression follows some kind of trauma event. And most people who've never had any depressive problems in their lives will report their first major episode in the mid or late 20s follows a job loss, may follow a divorce, or some other major life event that is highly stressful. And the nice thing about this in asking, why did you become depressed? Those of you who treat episodic major depression may have a treatment goal laid out for you an individual who may need to address a particular type of life stressor. So I'm always interested in what precipitated uh, a chronic depression. And this is also true for those who develop major depressions and who are chronically depressed. Usually, 
if you don't do anything with this individual for six to eight months, they'll remit. Not everyone. But a good majority of these episodic major depressions will remit by themselves with no treatment. Now, in differentiating between episodic acute major depression and chronic depression, which is now known in the nomenclature as persistent depressive disorder. For adults, this condition must last two or more years. For those under 21 years of age, one year. I'm going to focus today on the early onset type of chronic depression. And about 70 or 80 percent of the cases in the United States begin during adolescence. A modal age is 11, 12, 13 years of age, early adolescence. And one thing we've discovered, adolescents are pretty hardy as a group where you get an adolescent who's depressed, you begin to quickly suspect trouble at home. And that's part of this package, which I will talk about in a few minutes. 20% or maybe a little more of these persistent depressive disorder cases or chronic depressives begin in the mid twenties. And again, this is usually following some trauma event. And for some reason, which we cannot explain, about 20% of those late onset chronic cases, which began as a major episode, do not remit and will go on and develop a chronic course. So 70 or 80 percent will fall in that early adolescent, late adolescent age range. And then we've got that 20 percent and about a fifth of those beginning in the mid to late 20s will go on to develop a chronic course and frequently it doesn't matter whether they've been medicated or given psychotherapy with medication, they begin a chronic course. Oh, I wish we knew why, but we do not. So when we look at persistent depressive disorder, we got two types, the early onset, which is one of the old divisions, begins before age 21, and the late onset, which begins 21 years of age or older. Episodic major depression and persistent depressive disorder. <clears throat> what is chronic depression? This condition is a lifetime disorder unless it's properly treated. And I wrote a paper some years ago, the way chronic patients are treated today makes me sad. And uh, many of these patients are not treated very well. It seems to be the most effective treatment we've got today is a combination of medication with the range of serotonin drugs and CBAS psychotherapy. Symptoms that last one year in adolescence and two years or more as adults Down mood, this is nothing unusual. 
pessimism, extreme guilt feelings, feelings of fatigue, suicidal issues, frequently chronic suicidal issues, feelings of low self-esteem, and feelings of worthlessness. The big ones, hopelessness and despair for very good reasons. Weight loss, weight gain, sleep problems, and insomnia. Now, I'm going to add another symptom that characterizes many of my early onset patients. And this symptom may surprise you. A number of years ago, a Swiss psychologist by the name of Jean Piaget proposed some developmental stages from birth to adulthood. And there was one second stage that I think is most relevant for a good many patients that I begin to see and diagnose as chronic depressives. Preoperational functioning. Preoperational functioning. And one thing the persons I train uh, have to struggle with is this person sitting in the room whom they have diagnosed as chronic depressed or persistent depressive disorder is not like they are. They don't think the way they think and they don't emote the way they emote. Let me stop sharing and show you something on this screen. And I hope I can get back here. <clears throat> this is a kindergarten or first grade chair. And those of you with children uh, have been to the school rooms or the nursery schools and certainly seen these little bitty chairs. Surprisingly, these adult patients who look like adults and dress like adults do not function like you as an adult. In fact, the way they think is extremely primitive. And they function very much like five, six, seven-year-old little boys and girls. And that's one of the reasons they are so difficult to treat. You talk the way you usually talk to patients <clears throat> and probably don't think that you've got a little boy, a little girl sitting in your office and you can imagine a little bitty chair. Now, I want to say to you, this diagnostic category has nothing to do with IQ. I've seen some brilliant persons who in the workplace are brilliant in the way they can handle mathematical abstract concepts, but you put them with people and you got a little boy and a little girl. And I wanna make that really clear. This is not a low IQ individual, but you have a cognitive, emotive problem on your hands that functions in a very primitive way and that is very different than the way you live your life. Okay, now let's see if I can get back to this, this screen and I'll hit the share screen and uh, 
Uh, see what I can do. By gum, I did it. Uh, what is preoperational function? This is a patient who is totally egocentric. All roads lead to me. You, on the other hand, function very empathically. If you think about empathic functioning, that is a highly abstract construct. You have the ability to step back and perceive how another person may be feeling or what they may be thinking. The adult early onset chronic patient does not, in the beginning of treatment, have the capacity or empathic functioning. They don't abstract. Five, six, seven-year-old little children do not abstract. That's why we don't teach trigonometry in the first grade. They don't have the cognitive abstractive ability to deal with symbolic math. That's what you got in your room. They have no emotional regulation. To regulate emotions, you need to be able to abstract. You need to be able to step back from a situation, think about alternatives, think about other ways to react. A lot of strategies we use requires abstractive functioning to manage emotions. These patients don't have that capacity. Not in the beginning. The good news is they can acquire them, and I'll show you a little bit in a minute how they may acquire them. Interpersonally, they pervasively avoid. Got a good friend who's a colleague at the University of Vermont, Mark Boughton, who's a Pavlovian scholar. And Mark's axiom or law is wherever you got avoidance, you got fear. Wherever you've got avoidance around people, you got fear driving it. And you got a bucket load of interpersonal fear with these patients. These people think in pre-causal, pre-logical ways, and this makes them really differentiate from you. You think, if I do this, then this happens. If I don't do this, then this won't happen. The world is the way it is because I believe it is this way. Has nothing to do with hypothetical, inference drawing or hypothesis making. These people think in primitive ways. They think globally. Nobody likes me. Everything will always go wrong for me. I'll always fail. Nothing can ever work out. Listen to those adverbs. Patient is not like you. And a pervasive hopelessness and hopelessness stance. Now, what does this mean? If you woke up in the morning and if you assumed that today would be just like yesterday, which was a mess, and if the future only bore, bore more of the same, despair comes right on the heels. Nothing can work out. And this is what chronicity is. It orbits in a circle of sameness. Sameness. Today is like yesterday. Tomorrow, more of the same. This is the primitive patient that you will sit with. And this is why we have so much problem 
with the chronically depressed patient. All right, a couple of other things I want to say. What's the clinical course of episodic major depression? And I want you to look at the citation under this. Uh, in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2016, uh, my colleagues and I presented a way to draw the clinical course of episodic major depression. And you begin working from left to right. You first diagnose, and let's say we've got somebody in a major depression. How long has that major depression lasted? Well, it's lasted six months. And then what happened? Well, I felt better. And I went up to a normal mood and aid baseline and I had no depression. A year and a half ago, I felt just like I felt right now, right now in the present time. And I can graph the course, which is the way we learned to do it in diagnosing uh, patients in our clinical studies. And you can do this in your office with patients. And I'm going to really suggest you do this to differentiate between treating an episodic disorder of major depression and dealing with the chronic disorder. What does the early onset chronic depression clinical course look like? Again, you start in the present time. And at present, your adult patients may be diagnosed, diagnosed as dysthymic. And then this went on for about eight months, and then they fell into a major episode and came out of it and went back into a normal dysthymic baseline and then fell into another hole and on and on and on. And usually with early onsets, it will begin in early adolescence with dysthymia. And there are two things I got to do when somebody comes in complaining to me of depression. Is the disorder episodic or is it chronic? Have I got a PDD on my hands? And if it begins in early adolescence, is dysthymia back there in that course? And I'm going to diagnose as best the person can remember for dysthymia as best they can recall when it all began. But this methodology we've used in four national clinical trials with 2,200 patients. And it is really workable, practical, and can differentiate between episodic major depression and a chronic course. And is dysthymia back there in the, core, in, the, in the course? And if it is, you got some real problems at home. Now, told you a little while ago that I wrote a memoir, published it in 2019. It's called Swimming Upstream, a story about becoming human. Let me tell you a little about me. And we'll look at where persistent depressive disorder comes from. Let me tell you a little bit about my early history. Diagnosing myself, I was an early onset persistent depressive disorder. It began about 12 years of age. And I can remember riding my bicycle at 12 years of age. It was a hot summer day in North Louisiana, a long way from Washington in the Northwest. And I can remember thinking to myself, something is very wrong with my life, and I don't know how to fix it. I lived at home my first 18 years and faced a constant 
barrage of verbal and emotional abuse, primarily from my father and from a very demanding mother who did not play a nurturant, supportive role with me. And I started the long climb up the mountain with a chronic disorder. Listen to your patients talk. Listen to the way they laid it out, their life story. And if you had met me before age about 25, You've been hit with a barrage of interpersonal fears and social avoidance. I was an empty dude. And I functioned on a pre-operational level. I was able to maintain fairly good school grades. But inside, I was empty and dead. And I felt like Jean-Paul Sartre felt in one of his early writings, people were hell. And I really believe that. Let me show you what interpersonal possibilities are for the early onset patient. Here's Jim. Detached interpersonally and extremely in avoidance. In a lot of ways, I tried to keep my distance from people. Now that all, there were some really nice people back there, but look at this era. There was no one who could get to me. I was cut off. And I did not know how to open any doors. It was too fearful. And you get somebody like this and interpersonal learning is not possible. The only way you learn how to exist with other people is you got to interact with them and learn from your successes and learn from your failures. Man, I just kept my distance. And interpersonal learning is extremely limited in such a situation. The other price the chronic patient pays is that being cut off from the environment, the environment cannot influence or inform my behavior. I just orp it in a circle of sameness. A lot of stuff going on out there. But in a personally, I could not participate in it. That's by myself. Tremendously egocentric, self-centered. Can't get in touch with other people. There ain't nothing left on the field but yourself. I had my own views of the way the world is, was. It was pre-logical and pre-causal. And it was not a supportive world. It was a world where you could get hurt and get hurt I was a pretty angry young adolescent, and I have often felt a bit of guilt thinking about what my teachers in elementary and middle and early high school experienced in my presence in the classroom. Helpless and hopeless. Something is very wrong with my life, and I have no idea how to fix it. Gerald Clermont, in his 1981 book on interpersonal psychotherapy, on page eight, says the patient is responsible for change. Jerry was had really not thought that sentence out. 
chronic patients don't know how to change. They don't know what to do. They are stuck in a rut in a way that they can't get loose. How does that play out in therapy? The therapist has got to take the lead. And over time, that lead's going to shift from the domain of the therapist to the patient as the patient learns how to be a player. But learning to be a player or learning how to grow, it's not possible in the beginning. Severe abuse leads not to growth, but it leads to survival strategies. And it's a cognitive, emotional train wreck. So in order to mature, I had to learn as an adult what I never learned as a kid. Same situation, but CPAS treatment is designed to get through this barrier and get to this patient and break down these walls that I have erected to do what? To keep people at a distance. And this interpersonal learning not possible in the environment cannot inform behavior. At the end of treatment, interpersonal learning is possible and the environment can inform behavior. In fact, The encounter becomes an interaction between two people, which it is not in the beginning. I promise you. You can't encourage and nurture. you got a wall that you're going to have to take down. And that's what had to come down. And it took a while for my walls to come down. My recovery and subsequent maturity. I ended up participating in relationships and I learned that I was interpersonally safe. I had never felt safe in interpersonal relationships in my life. And I was in my early 20s when I first began to feel safe. And I had to learn interpersonal trust. You ever thought about how do you get trust in? It's not easy. And as I looked back on my early experiences with dysthymia and major depression, I've realized I had to construct a therapy method that was different that the usual therapy methods of disputing dysfunctional beliefs, uh, disproving uh, hypotheses that are off the wall, these weren't going to work. These were not going to work. I was going to have to construct a relationship where I became a comrade. And thinking about the first person that did that to me was a psychoanalyst by the name of Hank Olivier. And I have dedicated one of my books to Hank. Uh, Hank was a real person. And uh, I learned to deal with Hank. And a lot of my therapy clinical methods are based on the way I found the relationship with Hank. I learned that emotional stability from other persons uh, would be predictable. I never in relied on stability of, from other people. Boy, I had to learn that my behavior had consequences 
I never thought about the consequences. That's the cutoff point in the world I lived in. It mattered what I did. Everything matters. Everything matters. You can't walk across grass without mashing down the grass. You have effects and impacts everywhere you go. And I learned how to set goals and obtain and go after what I wanted. My life became very goal-oriented, and I wish we had time to talk a little bit more about that. In looking at sea bass, here are the two major goals. Patients must learn they are interpersonally safe with you. They will not be hurt or punished. And that's going to take a little time. Go one. You cannot learn anything if you feel unsafe. Go one. Go two. I got to learn my behavior has consequences. And it matters what I do or what she does. And then behavior can be influenced by the consequences that I am now recognizing, which before I never saw or understood. And then I got to learn to assert myself and learn the interpersonal skills to obtain what I want. Now I'm going to say something to you that may sound surprising. I've never known a chronically depressed patient that I felt like should not be depressed. And if I lived the way they live, I would be depressed too. So teaching them another way to live. Biology is certainly involved. Psychology is certainly involved. And the environment certainly involved. They all interact. But the therapist begins to establish a dietic zone of safety and then teaches the patient that everything they do has effects. Brand new understanding of existence. Now, what are some things to remember from what I said? Chronic depression is a lifestyle condition, and the way persons live maintains the disorder. You don't change, you stay depressed. And I know that when they first come into my life. Chronic depression is a lifetime, lifestyle condition without adequate treatment. And I'm finding too many patients who come into my office and they're being treated with neuroleptics now because some of the lesser strength medicines are simply not doing anything. And it makes me sad. More and more patients are being administered Seroquel, Geodon, and some other neuroleptics, and I'm frequently... Uh, finding patients in the early stages of tardive dyskinesia. A lot of folks don't know what the heck to do with these people. And everything they've thrown at them has done no good. You don't learn to change the way you live, you stay depressed. Types of chronic depression, early onset, late onset. Early onset chronic depression usually begins with severe problems in the family. And these
problems are developed while the brain is developing and there is a maturational train wreck, a maturational train wreck. And people are stunted in their development. It can be rectified later with good treatment. And they can get back on track and maturate and become mature adults. How do I know that? Because I did it. And I got a long list of people, beginning with Renee Spitz and her Marasmus kids and Moni in his Casper Hazar syndrome of dwarfism, of abused adolescents who come in 15 years old but with a body of an eight-year-old. Dante Sacchetti, Jean Piaget. These are people who were damaged earlier and it affected maturational development. Listen to the way your patients think and talk. Most effective treatment seems to be meds and CBAS psychotherapy. And chronic depression requires persons to learn interpersonally what they did not learn as children and adolescents. Oh, it's so good if you learn it the first time through the way it's supposed to be through. It's not the case. The last thing I want to say, and I'm going to stop. Chronic depression is never fully cured. And I began to teach patients this from the minute they come into my office. They can learn to manage it the way you learn to manage diabetes, or hypertension, it'll kill you if you don't manage it right, but you can learn to manage it, and they can learn to, ma to manage chronic depression or PDD. But the skills I'm te teaching, you're going to have to do for the rest of your life. And I found this damage that's early done is a bear to get rid of, and the brain, unfortunately, never forgets anything. So I want to stop at this point, and uh, I'll take whatever questions you got, and we'll uh, see where you are. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McCullough, and I'd like to encourage uh, participants to write in any questions uh, or comments and, and we can go through those uh, now. Um, so Dr. McCullough, I, I, uh, very helpful summary points at the end. And I, do, I have a question maybe to start things off. Um, what happens with an individual with chronic depression? What's the usual outcome if the person gets a maybe a, a treatment that's more so intended for episodic depression. Uh, what, what's the, is there symptomatic improvement? Does that usually not happen? What's the usual course? I can't answer that definitively, uh, but uh, if treatment goes on and in the usual case, where a therapist is relating to the patient in one way. Let me teach you how to cope. Uh, I think some interpersonal omissions may occur. And it may be somewhat effective, but I learned a long time ago that it's not sufficient. And if this person doesn't make some widespread changes in the way they live, I've found they're going to get depressed again. So that's the best I can say. I focus mostly on the chronics and not the episode. Thank you. Uh, and what is a, what's a, a modal duration for the CPAS, excuse me, CPAS psychotherapy? About 31, 32 hours. 
and I work my patients hard. Uh, it's an acquisition learning model. And Joe, it's, uh, let me make this outlandish statement to you. If you come in chronically depressed, if you learn what I've got to teach you, you'll beat the disorder. So you come in and it's not me just doing something to me. I'm going to teach you how to manage your life. And to the degree you do that, it's my assumption is the degree to which you'll beat this disorder. So my patients go to work <laughs> and I don't make it easy on them <laughs> because I know what's got to be done. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question came in from a participant uh, specific to the later onset uh, chronic depression. Uh, is uh, in that circumstance, do, do, have you observed a regression to pre-operational functioning? Changes yes, in the, yeah. that's the interesting thing. You take somebody who has a major episode at 29, they divorce, and they see their psychiatrist, they get some kind of medication, they may see a psychotherapist, but the dang depression doesn't go away. And the hopelessness and helplessness undermines the functioning of, uh, of the individual and it deteriorates over time. I mean, if nothing you do matters to the way you feel, then there's gonna come a place where it's over. But I gotta say another thing about the late onset Usually the late onsets have some early good experiences back there. A loving relationship, a caring parent. And we've got data on this. And uh, it's so much better to get somebody who's got in the brain neural connections of being loved, of being appreciated, of being affirmed, where it's not just being torn down. And uh, I'll take that any day. Then I don't have to get it in. Now, Dr. McCullough, uh, a, a, a comment also from uh, Dr. David Dunner. I'll just read it to you directly. Wait a minute. If, if David, I'm delighted David Dunner's out there. David, I hope you're fine and your family's okay. Okay, go ahead, Joe. <laughs> uh, a limitation of a webinar format, of course, but I would, I'll read this. Welcome okay. to Virtual Seattle, Big Jim. I hope your talk will inspire local therapists to learn CBAS. There are only a few cl clinicians locally who know how to do it. I find CBAS to be quite useful for patients with treatment-resistant depression who have responded uh, to esketamine, nasal spray, or TMS. Regards. Bravo for David. And, and David, you must know that CBASP has spread pretty widely in the United States, in Germany, in Switzerland, uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, it spread some in Japan and uh, it's in Finland, Scandinavian countries. So it's, it's moved around and uh, keeps me busy, but it's a good busy. And it's great hearing from you. Uh, and another question came in regarding um, disorders of attachment. Um, how do you see relate? Do you see relationship between disorders of attachment and persistent depressive disorder? Do you see them as similar? I had a brilliant clinical student. Her name is Catherine Berg, B E R G, and she revised John Bowlby and his attachment theory, and this is what she did. She said a patient who remits has two things going on, has a facilitative attachment clearly with the therapist and has learned to have it with others. And there's second thing that occurs. They have learned to think abstractly. They come in pre-operational, 
and abstractive functioning is not in. They leave and they can take a step back and perceive what's happening between them and somebody else and make choices. So the attachment is critical, but in addition, the maturational development of being able to function in an abstract manner interpersonally is critical. So uh, Katie really, really took Bowlby, I think, and pushed Bowlby out a little bit more with uh, remitted sea bass patients. Thank you. And, and perhaps as a final question to, to give a little bit of a break between uh, this, the next meeting with the group of clinicians here, but uh, Dr. McCullough, what uh, individuals with chronic depression, how do they engage with you over time? After the 32 hours, do people, people return? Are there booster sessions? They frequently do come back for booster sessions and we immediately go back to the old model and how would you handle it and what are your goals or desired outcomes for what's going down and let's plan out what you're gonna do. And how do I treat them? As comrades. I, my role, and this is probably the most unique piece to sea bass. I learned the traditional roles of psychotherapists. You've got a patient with whom these roles don't work very well. I mean, if I don't know how to relate to you and you sit there behind a wall of anonymity and I don't see you as a human being or a person, I learn nothing interpersonally and I stay just as isolated as I was. So I got to get in the trench, but I do it in a highly disciplined way with the well-being of the patient uppermost. And uh, I got in trouble with this in one of my clinical trials that Donner was a part of. And it was a 12 site clinical trial. And people began to accuse my uh, therapist of malpracticing because of the personal involvement. And I ended up writing a book in 2006, talking of trying to justify the way we treat just chronic patients, not for everybody. And my folks, you're not gonna get me out of the chronic depression pen. I'm staying right in there. But these patients are so battered and beat around that the traditional clinical roles simply are not that effective. I hope that makes sense. Well, Thank you very much, Dr. McCullough, for, for joining us today and, and for presenting and for your, your additional time with, with the next group uh, as well. We've all had uh, really an, an important opportunity to hear about chronic depression, understand uh, a, a new treatment, how it was developed, uh, testing of it, um, very helpful and informative and clinically uh, useful immediately in differentiating chronic and episodic. Very helpful. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad. Thank you so much, Joe. And again, hello, David. Don't know. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us, participants, and we'll end there. Bye-bye.